Hoopa! He's on the end, he's about to shoot the shark, and Hooper's trying to tie the thing up. Always waiting for him, so I call him Hooper. I'm always waiting for Hooper. The Porsche 928 is considered a luxury Grand Tour made from 1978 to 1995 and has the distinction of being Porsche's first front-mounted, water-cooled V8-powered model. This one here is a 1988 928 S4, which has a 5-liter, 4-valve, single overhead cam producing 316 horsepower and a 50-50 to front-to-rear weight distribution, despite weighing roughly 3,500 pounds. It's still quite agile, plus it's also a manual, making it highly desirable. By the time we convinced the owner to let it go, it was springtime and the snow had melted. I met up with the boys from North American Motor Car to load up the 928 after signing some paperwork as NAMC would be the new owners of the car after I get it all cleaned up. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Once inside and under the studio lights, you can see that this thing is a total mess. I mean, it's covered in mold, moss, leaves, dirt, and lots of black stuff covering pretty much every seam and crevice on the car. The first thing I needed to do because of the level of dirt was to raise the temperature of my pressure washer water to 120 degrees. I checked the inline meter to be 100% sure, and then I went to town. So for step number one, enjoy the most soothing power washing session I've ever done. The before and after is shocking. Next, I opened the hood and blew out the acorns and mice nests out of every pocket before Ted starts the repair in a few weeks. You guys remember Ted, he can fix anything, including a 91 year old doodle bug that was sitting in the woods for years before it started up and I drove it out. Now click the link above if you haven't seen the video, absolutely amazing transformation. Anyhow, you can see that the mice were living on top of the manifold, so we had a little bit of work to do down below. Now check this out. Now I found one of the many homes in this car I'm sure to find, but this one's pretty interesting. If you look here, clearly they've been living right here. You see the brownness, that's you know, pee, poo, that kind of thing. But at the same time, it's sort of like they're having a snack while they're in bed. If you look up here, when the hood comes down, obviously those two areas cover here. So they're probably hanging out here, looking up, munching on a little bit of the cushion. <laughs> I think that's pretty interesting. I am sure to find more homes. Next up, I wanted to see what the undercarriage looked like. If the top of the engine looked pretty bad, I can only imagine what underneath looked like. But first, I unlocked the lug nuts with the Porsche key so that I could loosen the bolts for later wheel removal. Then I mixed Boost, Brute, and Titan in the foamer to help release as much as I could during the 20-minute dwell time. Obviously, the goal here is just to let the cleaner do its work while I finish removing the wheels and then, of course, lifting the car to its full height to clean and inspect the underside. All right, so I just lifted up the car and I'm wolfing down some food, taking a little snack break here. And I have a big light back there you can see, so we can see underneath the, you know, underneath here. If you can see right over here, I'm gonna turn the camera around so you can see it. There is, let's see if I can zoom in here. There is a ton of yellow spots. Do you see them right there? That is urine. The urine is dripping down because I can smell it, but that's not grease, that is urine from the top. So that means I have to take this whole piece off here and bring it down and we are gonna find some interesting things. But anyways, wolfing down some food. And I was like, uh, I smell urine, what is that? And then sure enough, came over here, <laughs> urine drips. This is absolutely disgusting. In this process to get a little bit more access to the underside of the engine, I removed the front plastics revealing a bunch more leaves, a few critter homes and a renewed smell of urine. 
It's all urine. Ugh. My first step here is just to douse it with Titan degreaser, then let it soak in for a few minutes, and then afterwards hit it with Brute Wheel Soap out of the foamer. My goal is obviously just to make it a little bit safer, a little bit cleaner, and I guess less annoying to work on if you were a mechanic like Ted. Really disgusting. After my big scrub down, I rinsed once again and covered my floors in years of trapped dirt, grease, leaves, and whatever this is. I think a squirrel probably carried it up into the suspension, but it was pretty wild to see this stuck there. After a quick blowout with the compressor, the undercarriage wasn't Pebble Beach ready, but at the same time, you wouldn't be covered in urine either, so I considered it a win. With the car now down, I repeated the same steps on the top side and the engine. Lots of foam, lots of agitation with the microfiber towels, straight edge seam brushes, and round emblem brushes just to lift the years of mold and dirt. Afterwards, I cleaned the oily under tray with degreaser, then the wheels on the wheel stand. Now take a closer look at the wheels themselves. They're completely shot and in need of a refinish, but I gave them a quick clean and they came back better than I expected. Once everything was washed, rinsed, and dried, there was a bunch of stubborn mold areas sort of embedded in the surface of the paint that couldn't be removed with basic agitation. All right, now check this out. This is a concept called pinching. What happens is the paint heats up and contracts, heats up and contracts a thousand times over its lifetime. This one in particular has been sitting outside for 10 years. And if it's outside, it's really gonna be really hot, really cold, really hot, really cold. What does that mean? What happens is you can see here, I can't get the rest of this mold off. I've washed it, I've scrubbed it, I've hit it with degree. I've done everything I possibly can. It's not releasing it. So then I called Kevin and we talked about this concept called pinching. When it heats up and the dirt is on it, it falls down and then of course, as it cools down, and it does this process a hundred times, the dirt sort of falls deeper and deeper into the paint, metaphorically speaking. So what we need to do in this case is to heat it up to be able to open up those pores where the dirt's underneath, you open up those pores, then I can go in there with a towel and kind of easily clean it. So I said, okay, let's, let's test this process. In this case, I'm taking the steamer, right? Steam it up. You hit a little spot. Now I've just, look at that. It's a thousand times easier to clean. Why? Because I just opened up those pores, just like on your skin. As soon as you open them up, boom, you can clean it with a microfiber towel, pulls it right off, easy breezy. I wanna do this now so that when I'm compounding later, all that residue doesn't get stuck in the pad. So keep that in mind. With most of the exterior mold gone, now I focused on the interior mold. Step one is to remove everything from the inside and do a little bit of investigation while I do my initial vacuum. Although it's dirty and definitely moldy, it's actually not in horrible shape, meaning physically it feels good, which is really great news for the new owner. That's where I lost my keys. My specific technique on this interior was to first quickly heat up the seat with steam, spray lather, then agitate with my interior dual density small brush, and then simply scoop it up with a microfiber towel. As you can see, I didn't use the steam and the lather together because the seats were just not as bad as the oily GMC truck that required more strength to clean it. My point is this, use only what is needed and no more. Less is more during a preservation detail. When I was done, I followed up with compressed air to speed up the drying process and to remove any last remaining bits that I may have dislodged during the cleaning. Awesome, girl. The passenger side rear cushion was worse than all the others, so I removed it and put it on the workbench so I could clean it a little bit better. I repeated the same steps on the rest of the interior, the doors, and the door jams, which were a complete mess.
Now check this out, the 928 door sill sign had a bunch of brown junk stuck in all the edges. So I lifted it gently by hand and used the pressure from the steamer to flesh out all the debris. You can also see that the plastic clearly broke years ago, but at least it looks a thousand times cleaner than it did before. I repeated the same steps on the door and the passenger side seat as well. Now the trunk was a different story altogether. I couldn't just blast it with a power washer, so I had to use the aerator and froth the anti-salt to sort of spray it on there and then scoop up the dirt and mold without soaking all the sensitive parts with water in the trunk. Afterwards, just to kill a little bit of time, I re-scrubbed the calipers and suspension and needed a little bit more work until my latest version of the steam vac arrived in the mail to steam clean the carpets and of course the floor mats that I had previously removed from the car. With the car now cleaned, but not polished, I reinstalled the wheels because outside I finally received my Dr. Goop floor product in the mail. So me and the team from Dr. Goop pushed the car outside to redo the floor for the fourth time. Yes, you heard that correctly. If you haven't been keeping up with my floor debacle, it's been a soap opera to say the very least, but the failures that have happened over the past couple of weeks have been absolutely astonishing. So to make a very long story short, the builders failed to put rebar in the concrete the original time they poured it. So when I drove on the floor, it went up and down like a waterbed. As you can see in these pictures, the chunks of concrete that they cut up afterwards had no rebar through it. So it's sort of like pouring concrete on dirt in an open field. It has nothing to secure itself to. I cannot make this up. So this time they installed rebar, they poured concrete, and afterwards I called Dr. Goop himself to make sure my floor covering would be perfect this one last time. I'll have a full video coming soon on the studio channel if you wanna see the step-by-step -step process for your garage floor, but here is a week or so of work in 30 seconds. First, we taped off my cabinets and installed thick cardboard to protect the finish as round two of the previous floor's installation dinged and dented my cabinets in the process, which was not good. As I mentioned, this is actually a DIY product, but because my floors are such a disaster with so many different layers that needed to be scraped up, I just called in the professionals to show me the step-by-step -step process. First, I scraped up the little bits of clear bra that were stuck to the ground over the past few weeks of doing jobs. Then I pulled up the old coating, which is a lot more annoying than it looks, before sanding all the cracks with a polisher, scraping the floor again, chasing the cracks with yet another saw, making stress relief cuts on each lift opening with my trusty broom handle, then vacuuming and sweeping like there's no tomorrow. Oh yeah, then we scraped again and vacuumed again before mixing Dr. Goop's special juice, filling the cracks by hand, rolling the moisture tolerant primer across the entire garage, then mixed up the metallic gray with the drill and rolled it on the floor as the base color. Then the top coat is added for slip resistance and an amazing design with the squeegee. When done, my floors look like a mural and they're incredibly strong. I'll have a lot more information on the studio channel and my specific colors and info are in the description below. A week or so later, I pulled the 928 back inside and started the paint polishing process with a Meguiar's red foam pad. The before and after is absolutely huge on both the paint and the pad.
Okay, when you apply compound to your pad, this is an exorbitant amount. There's way too much, right, for normal polishing. But in this case, because there's so much residue coming off, it has to be filled somewhere. Obviously, the combination of the pad and the liquid, in this case compound, there has to be enough of that to hold onto it. Sort of like if you were plowing your driveway, the, dr the plow can only push so much. So what you need to do is either take smaller bites of the driveway or get a bigger plow. In this case, I put more liquid, so I'm making it a bigger plow so that I can push more residue. Hopefully that makes sense, but we're going along here. This takes forever, but it's just sort of, I mean, look at me, I'm covered in this stuff, but it's looking a thousand, I mean, that looks like brand new paint back there. So uh, pretty excited. On the roof, the steam could only lift so much of the mold and dirt, so I needed to add even more heat plus mechanical agitation with the red pad. Now, the downside is that your pad is going to fill up with residue faster and likely be required to be replaced faster, so keep that in mind if you use this technique. Now here's where it gets super interesting. After the mold or tree sap is removed, you can see the pinching I mentioned earlier under magnification. Look at the divots that were created over time. Now, we just cleaned out those divots with the red pad, but to remove those divots or the valleys, we call them, you're going to have to level or sand the paint. Now, because the paint is old and because it's very thin, I'm not going to do that here. Afterwards, because of the amount of residue and dirt from the compounding process, I had to quickly rewash the car to clean the gobs of dead paint residue off the surface. Once everything was dry, I touched up the paint with my needle and syringe and made an easily avoidable mistake. Okay, I'm behind the camera. I've been touching up a little bit of the, the areas here. Not a big deal, but using the syringe and the needle. And what I did was I forgot to smack it, you know, click it with like this and then squirt out a little bit to get the air out. And when you do that, or let me say you don't do that, you make a silly mistake like this, you can see there's little tiny air bubbles in there. Easy enough where I can just go in and wipe this off and start over, but it was a little bit of a dumb mistake. I should have slowed down a little bit and tapped it, squirted a little bit out, released the air and you're good to go. So make sure you keep that in mind. Finally, I did one last vacuum and installed the carpets, mats, rear seat that needed a little bit more love, owner's manual, and other valuables before adding moose moisturizer to the seats and trim. All right, buddy, then you can stop. We're done. We're done, princess. All done, princess. All done. To be super clear, this is not to add shine, although it will have gloss during the application process. This is to add moisture and protection to a dry or weathered surface. Now, after a few minutes, remove the excess material and the surface will return to a matte finish. On the paint, I added Reflex Pro to protect the surface now that I removed the dead layer of skin, which actually looked pretty terrible, but at the same time, it did protect the good paint underneath it, sort of like a windbreaker. So adding protection once you remove this old windbreaker is an important step to minimizing future oxidation. With the pickup day coming tomorrow, I added mud dressing to the trim and tires and cleaned the glass with Obey in a squeegee before the flatbed arrived. Well guys, we're done with the 928 and the thing looks absolutely amazing. Believe it or not, it's actually white underneath all the green mold and the black uh, sap or I don't even know what was on the car. But once you got underneath all of that, it actually looks spectacular and the paint is really high quality. So I love these single stage paints. Uh, I do believe 928s are going to be coming back uh, popular because I mean, look at this thing. It's absolutely amazing. Again, the wheels are roached out as you can see. And back here, just take a look at that. I brought in the 964 D90s. Uh, design 90s and I wanted to try it on there. It didn't look all that great, but I'm sort of kind of falling in love with this car and tweaking it. I'm like, man, what would the tints look like? Let's change the wheels around. Let's, that's, that's the exciting part about finding these cars and sort of bringing them back. Somebody texted me on Instagram and said, it's the Larry look back, meaning because I'm constantly looking back at the car when you walk away. So I thought that was kind of clever. On that note, because I do think these are coming back strong, 
This car is owned by North American Motor Car. I'll, I'll put the link down below. It is for sale, um, but I'm sure people are like freaking out already and texting me. So a, a huge privilege of mine to be able to do a car like this, find it and bring it back to life and hopefully put it back on the road uh, with a new owner. That's a big deal for me. So very exciting episode. As always guys, thanks for watching and I'll talk to you very soon. Oh yeah. Oh my <laughs> God. Amazing. Hey guys, I want to give you a quick update on the car detailing simulator. It looks absolutely spectacular, especially with the all new Ammo Studio and Supercar downloadable content that will be available by April 2022 on Steam. Make sure you click the link in the description to start playing.